Tech for Seniors, episode 26, September 21st, 2020. Hey, you guys, I screwed up last week and no one picked it up. Chris Rosinski did. It was 20, I said 24 episodes last week and it was 25. Sorry, that's our quarter, that's, that's our 25 episodes uh, under our belt. Sorry, Huey, sorry, guys. Thanks, Chris, for picking it up. In fact, I picked it up because I did, when I did the whole video, I rendered it all, posted it, and in the posting list, I thought, what's wrong with the sequencing? And again, I would screwed up. So I'm sorry, guys, this is 20, episode 26. So Huey, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm glad to be here. Are you? Great. We had a good week. Hi, Bob. Happy to be here. What as happened? Always. What happened to your uh, your goatee that you had earlier? Well, we'll save that for another time, and we'll go through what's been added that's brand new in Zoom. That's good. We should do that. Yeah. And Ray, 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 you're back. You had an internet catastrophe this week. Oh yeah, we have a cable company up here in Arizona called Sudden Link, and. Uh, my, not only the internet service, but the TV service isn't working. And they said, oh, Mr. Baxter, we'll help you right away. We'll send somebody there in a week. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've resurrected my service using an old Verizon MiFi, and I have basic service. So if I cut in and out today, that's why. So Huey and I were thinking about doing a poll on everybody. What would you consider in Florida more important, air conditioning or internet services? Huey, what do you think? I, I got to go with internet services. <laughs> you had no you had no air conditioning this I week. I had no air conditioner. That's right. Really tough. You but, really but my, need air conditioning in Florida. Yes, yes, for sure. that's for sure. All and, right. And as long as we have a uh, cell phone, we can get on the internet. Indeed. All right, let me just share my screen. If my air conditioning goes out, uh, there's a hotel nearby. <laughs> That'd be my choice, too. All right. Good. You should be able to get... Um... So I wanted just to tell it. So I had a good week. Uh, Huey and I were busy last week. We ran our, um, we ran our uh, Chromebook SIG, and I wanted just to remind everybody uh, if you want to participate in the uh, Chromebook SIG, we're going to do it again in a month. Uh, just on our, on our website, Tech for Senior, which you can see here, uh, just click on the link here, uh, register for learning Chromebooks, click this link. And if you click that link, then you can uh, register. We'll send you all the information that you need. It's free. And Huey and I are going to do this uh, once a month. Uh, the uh, the are recorded. The uh, these the, the sessions are recorded, and uh, we have sent the link out in our newsletter. So you can watch these if you haven't seen it. Then you can watch the uh, watch the show. So everyone, just uh, be sure if you're interested in Chromebooks, please just click the link, and we'll send you. We'll get you registered, and there is no charge, and you're, there's no membership. Any senior can 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 come online. Or now the other one is uh, on our website. You see here the newsletter. Uh, we have some new people uh, in the in the uh, in the audience today, and I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, please on on our website you can see here Tech for Seniors. All as we ask is we just ask for your first name and your email address, and bingo, uh, you are subscribed. If you don't like us and you don't want to do it, or you're getting too much email, you can simply unsubscribe as well. It's really easy to subscribe and unsubscribe, but this is the only way that we really know who you are and can keep in touch with you and let you know as, uh, from different things that are happening. And we send out two newsletters a week. One is on Tuesday and one is on Saturday. Uh, also, for those of you who, uh, who are um, new as well, is we tape all these episodes. And they're all taped, and and again, in the uh, on our website and in the newsletter, we have links to uh, all uh, all of these. But uh, you'll see here um, many hundreds of hours of me editing videos. Uh, you'll see that we've come down, and we're at episode 25. So, uh, if you want to use these episodes for any of your uh, for your computer clubs, you're looking for content. 
uh, you can come down and you can certainly be happy to use them. There's no, uh, no reason why you couldn't use these for your, uh, for your club. Just quickly, I wanted to, um, I just wanted to do one quick thing before we, we get on here. Uh, let's have a look here. I wanted to talk about, and I'm, let's get my PowerPoint going here. I wanted to talk about the announcement. I'll just make this real quick this week. Uh, I wanted to talk about the new Apple Watch that came out this week. This was the big Apple announcement, and this was the Apple Watch. And the Apple Watch, um, if you see here, uh, you'll see this is the, uh, the prices. They brought out two new watches. One is the Apple Watch Series 6. And this is, uh, replay, this is uh, a new addition to the Series 5. And this is, um, uh, and we'll go over that in just a second. But they also brought out the Apple Watch SE. Now the SE is really the Apple Watch Series 5 without the ECG monitor. The big difference with the Apple Watch 6 is, is it's got the fast processor in it and it has the oxygen sensor now. So they made a little bit of change, but otherwise it's about the same. But I'm really interested in the Apple Watch SE because of the cost, it's, it's a lot cheaper. Now, if you look down at the specs, uh, this is where it's really interesting. So you see the Apple Watch series, what, so what is it in, for seniors that's important here? The Apple Watch Series 6, yes, it has fall detection, but the Apple Watch SE, the one for 275, also has fall detection, as, uh, but, but of course the, the Series 3 doesn't. So, so this is sort of cool in that the, the lower level does as well. Now, if you come down here, um, if you look at the high, low, and irregular heart notification, those of you who have gone through and you've listened to my program on uh, saving your life with wearable technology, you will, um, you'll see that, you'll know that this is very, very important, uh, is the irregularity of notification of heart rate. And notice that the Apple Watch SE does that. It does not do ECG, but it does, it does do that as well. So um, again, um, this may be uh, uh, an interesting product, and this is a new product that Apple has brought out, uh, which really, I guess, follows the, the, the Apple, the new iPhone SE because of the, the price cost. So I wanted just to let everyone, that was the big, the big announcement this week was, uh, was the, uh, the release of the Apple Watch. All right, I've blabbed on long enough. Bob, I think you're up. Okie dokie. Uh, let's share the screen. Better make sure we got sound, otherwise it's not going to do much good. Loud and clear. Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending September 18th, 2020. Hacking. What is it? Hacking is the general term for computer system intrusions and subversions, and here are some examples. Phishing. It's a hacking method where the target is fooled into giving up their security and personal info. Malware. Viruses, Trojans, Internet worms, adware, and worst of the bunch, ransomware. Social engineering. Preys on the vulnerability of the computer or device user. Usually, it's the weakest link. Distributed denial of service attack. A DDoS attack floods a specific server with so many requests for service that it becomes either unusably slow or completely inaccessible. Fake Wi-Fi hotspots. Usually named something similar to the real thing, something like hotel Wi-Fi or airport lounge. When someone connects to this network, the hacker has full control of the packets, which are the data. Clickjacking. It's a strategy that fools you into clicking on something other than what you think you've clicked on. Two basic flaws make it easy for hackers to break into your systems. Number one, weak passwords, allowing hackers to gain access to accounts by using brute force attacks. Cracking the password of one account shouldn't be enough to gain full access to an internet network. 
but in many cases, it just takes this and the ability to exploit known vulnerabilities to gain further access to the system. Number two, not updating. In addition to weak passwords, over two-thirds of organizations are using vulnerable versions of software that hasn't received the required security updates, leaving it open to being exploited. Use a password manager so you don't use the same password or a weak password and update whenever a new version is available. Plug those security vulnerabilities. The debate over face mask recognition the contentious debate over facial recognition software and now mask recognition software rages as developers race to pioneer the best algorithms despite substantial criticism from privacy advocates. The U.S. does not have a federal law governing data privacy, so the questions as to whether recognition software crosses the line into privacy infringement or not remains undecided. Proponents of mask recognition software claim it is not anti-privacy because it does not identify specific people. Facial recognition software, like the kind that allows iPhones to identify their owner's faces, relies on a training set, an initial face it's trained to identify. Mask recognition software is intended only to identify if someone is wearing a mask or not. I personally don't have tracking app on my phone. You need to make your own decision on this controversial topic. YouTube hit with a 2.5 billion pound lawsuit over children's data. London-based nonprofit Foxglove has taken representative action against YouTube, seeking 2.5 billion pounds in damages for allegedly breaking UK and European data protection laws by targeting up to 5 million children under the age of 13 with addictive programming and data harvesting. Foxglove maintained that Google-owned YouTube pitched itself to toy makers Hasbro and Mattel as the favorite website of kids 2 to 12. Foxglove stated that if the case succeeds, millions of British households whose kids watch YouTube may be owed hundreds of pounds. YouTube claims the website was not intended for children under the age of 13, referring them instead to the YouTube Kids app developed back in 2015. TikTok pushes to settle child privacy lawsuit ahead of its sale. As the Oracle acquisition of its U.S. operation nears, TikTok is hurrying to settle a privacy lawsuit in Illinois. The suit alleges that TikTok unlawfully recorded minors' personal information, including face scans, both to be used for marketing purposes and to bolster further AI development in China. According to the Wall Street Journal, face geometry scans and voice prints are collected by TikTok and use to recommend content based on users' age, race, and physical attractiveness. A Facebook whistleblower exposes negligence and sluggishness. When Facebook data scientist Sophie Zhang was fired, she turned down a $64,000 non-disparagement package so that she could speak out against the slow movement poor organization and negligent behavior among the top brass at the social giant, which has allowed multiple foreign governments to use the platform for criminal subterfuge, such as undermining elections. I have personally made decisions that affected national presidents without oversight and taken action to enforce against so many political politicians globally that I've lost count, Zhang wrote in the 6,600 word memo. You can read the full story on BuzzFeed. And that's enough security related news for one week. Stay safe. See you next week. Bye bye. Just, well, a slight wow. up, just a slight update on the TikTok. Right now, they've gotten a reprieve until next week. So it's not 100% settled yet. Yikes. Okay. Well, Bob, thanks for keeping us safe. I, I feel better when you're around, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay.
All right. So uh, I've been talking a couple of weeks now that I'm going to talk about purchase considerations for a new computer. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. Uh, I'm going to sort of do something a little bit different. And I want you to uh, let's just see how this works. Uh, for those of you who use uh, Zoom in presentations, we're going to do something just a little bit different. When I go to share my screen, I'm going to go over to the advanced feature and we're going to start my PowerPoint presentation in the beta feature here. And this should, hopefully this will work. We will see how things work. And uh, so, can you see me? Yes. Yeah, I think that's cool. And so you see me at the bottom of the screen and, uh, and, the, and the presentation is actually behind me. Yeah, but on the my screen, your um, image is also in the uh, thumbnail section. Uh, okay. Yep. Do we hide that? No, if he doesn't want to see the thumbs, thumb uh, things, get rid of them. Just move them. Yeah, yeah but you, anyway, you, so you can, you can, uh, so now I can, uh, I'm part of the presentation and you can see that. So. So yeah, I thought this is sort of cool. This is a new beta feature in Zoom. So, so uh, you know, if I want, Huey said, don't, don't point, don't do that sort of thing. But we've been playing with this this week and I thought I would uh, test it out and see. So today we're gonna talk about purchase considerations for a new computer. Now, uh, again, hopefully nobody is using the old uh, Windows 7 machines. Uh, and so, now, the other thing is, uh, are you seeing the whole screen? Because um, the little bottom no. part looks cut off. I know that. Da, 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 da. Anyway, so what, the, what, what, what this, picture is, uh, uh, this picture is supposed to portray is you are the experts on, on, uh, on, on computers because you are at Tech for Seniors or you're at Silvercon CTC. And people often will come to you as wise people and ask what type of computers to buy. So what we're gonna talk about today is, uh, is four people who are gonna come, five people who are gonna come to you and ask you what computer to buy. So um, the first uh, is, a, is, is um, a man in, who is Fred. Fred is a 71 year old computer man, or com sorry, you're going to choose. So the goal here is we're going to go through five people and I want everyone to think about it, but you're going to recommend either a Windows 10 laptop, you're going to recommend a Chromebook, you're going to recommend an iMac, an iPad, or a Kindle Fire. Okay. So as we go through this, uh, you're going to, you're going to recommend, um, you're going to, I want you to think about what you would recommend and I'll tell you what I'm going to recommend and this will give you some, and then the, at the end, you'll sort of see how this all affects how you might think about purchasing a computer. So Fred is a 71 year old widowed man who wants to buy a new computer. He knows you are a member of Silvercom CTC or, or Tech for Seniors and asks your advice. And so what questions would you ask? Well, you could say, do you own a computer? And Fred would say, um, yes, I have an old Windows 7 machine that is on its last legs. Do you like Windows and do you use your computer very much? Well, he says Windows is complicated and using a computer once a week to do banking, check email and look at sports scores. And that's really all he does. And he really finds Windows very complicated. So the next thing that, that I asked Fred was, I said, you know, Fred, do you own a cell phone? And he says, no, I don't own a cell phone but my kids want me to get one because I had a heart attack six, year, six months ago and they live in Australia. Oh, by the way, I gotta tell you, when I gave this presentation to my club, everybody in the club thought it's Brown doing another Chromebook, promoting Chromebooks. So I wanna just tell you that to start out with, all right? That's not the case, all right? So he says, uh, no, but my kids want me to get one because I had a heart attack six months ago and they live in Australia. So you talk to Fred and you say, well, you know, that's a long way away. And Fred looks a little depressed and says, you know, they never call me. 
You know, last time I visited them in Australia, the grandkids had phones and they did this thing called FaceTime. Now, for those of you who are not Apple people, FaceTime is, well, it's not in messaging, it's, uh, it's video calling and it's like on steroids. Uh, it is a super good system that, is, um, that Apple has uh, used for many years, but it's only available on uh, Apple devices. So if they had decided many years ago to, uh, to allow everybody to use this, it would be the world standard. But this is really, really significant if you wanna keep in touch with people in the family who have other Apple devices. So Fred doesn't have a cell phone. He wants to keep in touch with his, his family. So what, um, what are Fred's purchase requirements here? Well, he has minimal computing requirements. He doesn't do much with it. His big issue here is he needs to purchase a cell phone. He needs better communication with his family, which is FaceTime. He had a recent heart attack, right? So all you of people who've watched my, my, my um, Saving Your Life with Wearable Technology will think, watch, watch, Apple watch, and he doesn't like Windows. So here's a fellow that I would recommend. I think he would be great uh, to have a, uh, I would get him an iPhone. Maybe the iPhone SE would be fine. He could get a, an Apple Watch. And I think this is someone who would do real well with an iPad. He would just do fine with an iPad. It would all work together and it, it would be great. So that's what I would sort of recommend in this, this situation. So as I said, Fred requires a cell phone. His family uses iPhones and does FaceTime and his computer needs are, computer, um, needs are minimal. So I, I think that would be the right package for Fred. All right, let's go on. Uh, and when you're considering this, try to stay within the same operating system. Uh, one of the big problems I, uh, I see is that particularly someone has an iPhone and they go and buy a Chromebook and then they come to our Chromebook SIG and they have an iPhone. I mean, it, it, it really, I would tend to try and stay in the same operating system. It just works better. Consider your smartphone for future purchases. Always consider how this is gonna play into what computer you buy. Consider your family members, and as we talk about in a minute, let's consider any special requirements. So the next person is Larry, is a 68-year-old retired accountant who comes to Silveridge in our winter to play golf and play pickleball. He's a popular guy in trans and a treasurer for many clubs. He uses Excel for his accounting and checks his email every day. Larry doesn't spend much time on the computer and asks for advice on his dying Windows 7 machine. So uh, what questions would you ask? Well, the first is, um, what cell phone do you own? And he says, well, I own an Android, three-year-old Android. Does your wife use a computer? Yes, her checks her email once a week and uses it for sewing programs. Hmm, okay. So she, does your wife have a cell phone? No. So Larry's purchase requirements, uh, of course, he's an accountant. And you know, accountants have always lived in Excel. Their whole life, they, that's the only program they ever know is Excel. And so they, they're really in Excel. So I probably are gonna keep them in Windows Excel. The key here is his wife also uses the computer and she has some sewing programs. I bet those sewing programs are Windows only. So in his consideration, I think, um, and he also has an Android phone. So in his consideration, I would get him a Windows 10 laptop. I think this is a, a good example of that. I, I suspect his wife's sewing program uh, would not run on a Chromebook. So, um, so that consider other people in your family when you're looking at it. All right, so Mary, uh, the third person is Mary is a, a uh, 68 year old permanent resident at Silver Ridge. Since her husband's death two years ago, she has struggled with making her old Windows 7 machine work. She is a member of the Silvercom Computer Club and heard about Chromebooks. Her neighbor and best friend has a Chromebook and thinks it's great. She wonders if she could get a Chromebook or iPad and ask for your advice. So what questions would you ask? Well, I said, what, Mary, what do you use your computer for? She says, well, I use it for email, banking, and Facebook. 
So I then say, well, um, what cell phone do you own? Well, she loves taking pictures and just purchased the Pixel 4, an Android phone, to add to her large photo collection of Google Photos. So she has an Android phone. She has, she's into pictures. She's doing Google Photos. So this, and she wants to know iPad or Chromebook. Well, this is a good example of, of where a Chromebook would fit in really well. She has an Android uh, phone and that will work well and connect well with the uh, Chromebook. So that would be, and particularly a Pixel 4, so that would be a good fit. So in her case, I would recommend a Chromebook, okay? So then let's go on to the, yeah, so she has minimal computer requirements. She has a friend with a Chromebook, she has an Android phone, and she has Google, Google Photos, which is great. All right, then uh, we come up with uh, Charles. Charles is, a, uh, is the fourth person. He's a widowed fine arts teacher who comes to Silver Ridge for the winter. He teaches dancing and wants to make instructional videos. Uh, Charles, has some ex Charles has some expensive movie cameras and really wants to get into video editing. He is financially well off and asks your advice on what computer he should buy. Well, uh, the first thing you say is, uh, do you own a computer? And he says, no, but at school we had IMAX. Uh, do you own a cell phone? Yes, I own an iPhone 11. This is one where you simply tell him where the, um, where the Apple store is. This is a classic example of where he's going to buy an iMac. And don't even discuss it, just send them right to the Apple store. He's the, uh, he's the uh, classic example of someone who, uh, because Apple does really well with video editing, he already has Apple equipment, so he would be, he would be an iMac candidate. Now, uh, and I want to just, in, in closing, I want to talk about uh, Jerry and Carol want to buy their six and eight year old grandchildren computers for Christmas. They are worried about safety on the internet and websites that children shouldn't see. And I brought this one up and threw it in because what I'd like to um, remember is, is the, the Fire HD 10s, the, the Amazon devices. These are really, really excellent devices and they're cheap. They are so cheap. They're about the third of the cost of, uh, of a Samsung tablet. And they are, are, are very protective for children. And I bought, Gail has one, my wife, and I bought her, I think it was on, and we're coming up to Amazon's um, big sale of the year, their Amazon day in the summer. And these things go on sale so cheap. I think I bought Gail's was $160. These are 10 inch screens. And I think it was on sale for 120. And then they threw in another 30, another, another bunch of RAM. And I think I got for 128 gigabytes of RAM for 120 bucks. So these, these devices are really cool. And I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, for, for computer needs, these, these are fun. Now the, the, the only downside is you really are falling into the Amazon ecosystem but they do work well on the web. You can do email and all sorts of stuff with them. And so don't forget about these. So those are uh, my four picks. It's 930. I am going to get the heck out of here and uh, stop sharing my screen because Huey's up. Let me see. How do I say? Here we go. Huey's up. Are you ready to go? I am. I just thought I hit the button. I didn't. So we'll do it now. Who's, uh, whose phone's on? Mine. <laughs> oh, yours. I'm not going to mute, mute you. It's in the background. It'll shut off. It's the iPhone, so I don't have it near me. I don't answer. It's, it's got to be spam. So uh, let's see. I am good to go here. So let me go ahead and start this. Uh, wow. file compression, or zip files, I'm Huey Poplock. First, let's start out with a little bit about the history of zip files. In 1985, Tom Henderson 
of System Enhancement Associates, also known as CSEA, wrote a program called ARC that not only grouped files into a single archive file, but also compressed them to save disk space. This was a feature of great importance on early personal computers, where space was very limited and modem transmission speeds were extremely slow. The archive files produced by ARC had file names ending in .arc and were thus sometimes called ARC files. Later, Phil Katz developed his own shareware utilities, PKARC and PKXARC, to create archive files and extract their contents. These files worked with the archive file format used by ARC and were significantly faster than ARC on the IBM PC platform due to selective assembly language coding. Unlike C, which combined archive creation and archive file extraction in a single program, CATS divided these functions between two separate utilities, reducing the amount of memory needed to run them. PKARC also allowed the creation of self-extracting archives, which could unpack themselves without requiring an external file extraction utility. The company that made ARC, called C, or the System Enhanced Associ Enhancement Associates, sued PKARC, and they claimed that the file format for .arc was their copyright and that PKARC the PKR guy was not allowed to copy it. C sued the PKR guy and won. So the PKR guy made a few a new format called .zip. And it compressed better than .arc. And within a few months, ARC files were a thing of the past, and zip files became the standard, and C pretty much disappeared. Now, why was this important? Back in those days, in the late eight, mid and late 80s, 5 megabyte files were almost unheard of. But let's just take for an example a 5 megabyte photo that we have these days, which would be about a 5 megapixel picture. In those days, in a 1200 baud modem, it would take 9 hours, 42 minutes, and 52 seconds to transmit that 5 megabyte photo. As the speeds of modems increased, they got up to 56K modems. It still would take 12 minutes and 28 seconds or 12 and a half minutes for one picture to transmit and download. Today, on a 10 megabit internet, it takes four seconds. If you have 40 megabits, it's one second. Now, to compare that with some existing files, let's say a one gigabyte file on a 56K modem that would take 41 hours and 25 minutes to download. In today's internet speeds, at 10 megabits, that takes about 14, a uh, little over 14 minutes. At four megabits per second, it takes three minutes and 34 seconds. And I have 150 megabits download and it would take less than a minute. So that's, it's not quite as important today as far as speed goes because we are able to transmit large files very quickly. But when you compress files into a zip file, you're making it far easier to send and transfer multiple files at once. A single zip file can include hundreds of other files and folders, which would be a nightmare to send individually. On top of this, .zip files actually reduce the overall file size of your content. This means that you can store your files in a compressed .zip file and save space on your, in your storage. It becomes faster to send the zip files and it's faster to download them because of the compression that takes place. But don't worry though, once a zip file is uncompressed or unzipped, you'll get all of your files in their original quality and size. If you do transfer a lot of zip files, make sure to delete the archives 
after uncompressing them because otherwise you'll have both the .zip file contents and the original .zip, both of which will take up space in your storage. People compress electronic files for different reasons, to make them easier to transport electronically, to organize their backups, or to save device storage space, for example. Let's take a look at zip files on iOS. To do so, you open the Files app on the iPhone or iPad. You navigate to the file or folder you want to create on the zip archive in the Files app, and it can be locally uh, or on the iCloud drive. Three, you tap and hold the file or folder you want to make zip, a zip, and then choose Compress from the pop-up menu. Wait a moment or a few, and the freshly created zip archive will appear in the same folder of Files app. And then five, repeat with other items you wish to create a zip archive if desired. Let's take a look at what we're talking about. This is my iPhone, and we have some photos that we want to zip up and email to somebody as a group. First, we're going to go to the Files app. When we click on it, we'll see that we have some images and some folders. You might have, obviously you have a lot more in yours, but we want to choose some files to include in our archives. You go to the top right where the three dots are. When we click on it, we're going to choose select and we're going to select what files we want to include in the zip archive. There's one, two, and now the third one. Now we go to the bottom right where the three dots are, and we're going to tell it to compress. It, it immediately created an archive.zip, which we can rename. Okay, next what we need to do is open up our email program, create a new email, make sure to give it a subject, and then in the message area you'll want to hard press until this pop-up comes up where you can select or select all, but notice there's an arrow to the right. You click it once, you quote level, insert photo or video. That's not what we're going to do now. We're going to add a document, which was the next arrow. When we click it, it then shows us all of the documents that are in the folder that we just worked with. We choose the zip. It puts it in our email. Then we're going to type a short message or a long message if you prefer. And then you go to the up arrow to send it. And off it goes. Now let's take a look at what that what's in that archive. We click it. It has it says it has three items in it. When we click it, it shows us what those three items are, and that's, we've created a zip file that contain three items. Dot .zip files on Android. To do so, creating zip files is also possible on Android, so long as you download an app with the right functionality. In other words, it's not built into the Android operating system. Unfortunately, most of the apps that offer this function aren't exactly among the best Android apps available. So be careful when downloading these apps. A lot of them have advertising, a lot of them don't work well, a lot of them have a lot of bugs in them. For this demo, we're using Z Archiver, which is ad-free and only requests permissions to access files as it should. Once you've installed Z Archiver, open the app, you'll see a simple file navigator. 
Locate the folder that contains the files you would like to zip. Next, tap the three dots at the top and select Create. After, select Create Archive. Choose the archive file type. I suggest going with Zip. 7-Zip is, an is another choice. And then you also have some TARS. If you're unsure, uh, use the dot zip and then choose a name. Next, click OK. You can then tap to select multiple files for your zip folder. Once you've selected your files, tap the green tick at the bottom of the screen. If it was successful, you'll see a message pop up saying archive successfully created. And you'll find the new archive file in the folder you've created it in. Let's take a look. Zipping files or archiving files on an Android is not quite as easy as it is on the iPhone or on Windows and most likely on a Mac. I'm not a Mac user, so I can't vouch for that. But in order to do it on my Android phone, I need to install some software. And what I found, first you have to go to uh, the Google Play Store, and then you have to search for uh, zip or zip file. And the one that's recommended is one down here called Zip Archiver. I, not by experience, because I am used to WinZip, and I'm used to the RAR, but actually the, uh, of the ones that I read about, Zip Archiver uh, is a little bit higher rating, so that's the one I installed. And if I click on it here, it's already installed on here, so it would say open. Uh, if it wasn't, it would where it says open, it would say install, and then I went ahead and I installed it. And we're going to go to where, find out where it is, and it's on this screen, and it's the Z Archiver. When I click on it, I'm going with all of this. Let's try the DCIM and the camera. And that's where we wanted to go, because so we're going to look we're going to where the camera photos are located. I click on the left, it then highlights it and shows that I've chosen that one. The next one I want to choose is down here at the left, and it highlights it. 727 is the one I want next, which is this one. So I want to take these three pictures and archive them. So we've got them now highlighted. There's a couple of ways I could do it. I could go to the three little dots at the top, or I can click the down arrow. I'm going to click the down arrow, and it gives me some information. One is, what do I want to call the archive? So I'm going to click on that, and now I can change that to either a zip, a tar, uh, and we're going to choose zip. 7Z is if you're using the 7-Zip program. I use, I, I like the zip because almost everything will open the zip, fast compression. I just leave everything else and I say, okay. It has now created a file called ACZip. And that is in that folder. I'm not sure if that's where we want it or not, but that's where it is. I'm gonna exit this. And now we wanna create an email. So I'm going to go to my email. I'm going to say I want a new email. We're going to attach from Z archive. We're going to find the DSIM camera. It already has where to put it. We now have it attached. Say and we tell it to go ahead and set, make sure we get it all right, and we send it. it. Says it's sending the email. We check our email, and bingo, there it is. 
we can click on it. There is a zip file, and when we click on that, it says, what do you want to open it with? We say ZA Archiver, and there are the three photos. And if we click on one of them, it's going to say, okay, what do you want to open it with? We're going to say photos, and there's the picture that we wanted uh, with the other three, and that's it. Not easy, but it can be done quickly, and uh, you'll have sent a complete package to the other person so pictures aren't lost. Unzipping is a bit easier on the Android. What we're going to do is we're going to go to My Files or on the Android, and we're going to go to the Internal Storage. And we, if you remember, we have that in the DCIM folder and in the camera folder. And there's the ac.zip. We click on it. There are the files and hit extract. We can take a look at it. And if it wants to know what we want to open it with, we'll open it with photo. And there it is. It's very easy to, uh, you don't have to install the program to to look at a zipped file. If you want to zip them, then you do have to have the extra app. Dot zip files on Windows. Select the files you want to add to the zip file. Right click one of the files, a menu will appear. In the menu, click send to and select compressed zip folder, which creates a zip file. A zip file will appear. If you want, you can type a new name for the zip file. Let's see how to do that. To create an archive or zip file in Windows, it's a lot easier in Windows than it is on the iOS or on the iPhone or iPad or on an Android uh, device. So let's take a look at what we have to do in Windows to create a zip file. Right now we're looking at a folder in, a, in my downloads fol folder and it's a subfolder called Ring Doorbell. There are 24 items in here. We're going to choose all 24 of those. That's 105 megabytes of 24 files and we're going to right mouse click, come down to send to and then it's going to say compressed zip folder. I'm going to click on that. It's going to create a folder or a file, a zip file, and it's going to call it just something. So we're just going to change that to ring files. So we now have a zip file here called ring files and it's just under 60 megabytes and remember the whole folder was 105 so it is compressing or letting some of the air out of the tires to make it easier in one package to send everything so now we have the ring files dot zip file we're going to now send it to our desktop and we're going to bring that onto the here we'll minimize this so now all we have is a shortcut to ringfiles.zip when we click it it will open up the zip file and show us everything that's in the file and it also tells us how much of a compression so it shows the, the compressed size the actual size and what the ratio is. So some you can see some of the files have quite a bit uh, have quite a bit of compression, where other ones have very little. Here's a PDF that has a compression rate of 45%. It's almost half the size in the in a compressed form within the zip file. And that's all there is to creating and taking a look at a zip file in Windows. Thank you very much. I'm Huey Poplock. 
I threw a lot at you there. Uh, and I didn't mention the Chromebook and I've tried it on my Chromebook and uh, it's actually very easy to do on a Chromebook, easier than on an Android. Uh, uh, it is built into it. Uh, we don't have time for questions yet. Uh, maybe at the end, if not, please submit any. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to Ron. Thank you. That Now, I want everyone to realize how much effort Huey put into that. Uh, when you start making videos, you realize that is a lot of work. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, it will be posted again, um, and we will have the links in the show notes so that you could use this in your computer club. That'd be a great program for you. Uh, thank you so much, Huey, for doing that. Yeah, I can also do it live for groups as well. Yes. Uh, I'll uh, be able to answer a lot more questions there and, and maybe do some other demos with it. A absolutely, absolutely. All right, uh, now the one of the most popular times of our show is when we get to talk to Ray. Where's Ray? Ray, come in, please. Here I am. There you are. There you are. Great. I don't know why I didn't get you on my screen. Um, just let me say, but Ray, um, Ray has had a really hard problem or time this week with his internet. So he's going to do the, the talking about this um, this um, this uh, clip we're going to listen to, and then I'm going to show it, right, Ray? Yes, that would be perfect. Thank you very much, Ron. Okay, so uh, take it away. All right, and the, as I talk about this uh, next clip and a little bit of history about a particular song, I want you to know that uh, when Ron does the newsletter, he puts in my comments. So if you don't catch it all now, don't worry, they'll, they'll be in the newsletter. So uh, word of the day today is mimic. So we all remember the song, The Twist. Chubby Checker did it, uh, but did you know that the original was done years earlier by a guy named Hank Ballard and his group in the mid-90s, he was an R&B singer? It was Dick Clark's wife that heard that original, and she also knew this young Philadelphia singer whose name was Ernest Evans, and uh, his claim to fame at the time was he was a phenomenal mimic, and he could imitate other people's voices perfectly. So she had Evans listen to the original version of the twist, and then arranged for him to record it. The rest is musical history because the twist is the only song in rock and roll history to ever make it to number one in two different years. So years later, Hank Ballard was being interviewed and he told the story that he was at a resort sitting by the pool. And when the song, The Twist came blaring over the speakers, it was a full minute before he realized it was not him singing. That's how good uh, Chubby Checker was. So Clark's wife is also responsible for Evan's name change to Chubby Checker, making it similar to another popular singer of the day, Fats Domino. Think about it, Chubby Checker, Fats Domino. Let's fast forward to the 21st century. And we have so many different television programs that are sh around the world now showing local singing talent in competition with each other. There's even a program called Mongolia's Got Talent. And uh, in its second season, Ank Erden was the winner. So the video clip we're about to see shows him being interviewed with the help of a translator. And then he amazes everyone when he sings Amarillo by Morning, a Terry Stafford song made famous by the great George Strait. Amazing, thank you, Ray. I hope everybody liked that. Oh my gosh, that was just unbelievable. Well, you know what? It's top of the hour. I'm sorry, time is out. Uh, another one for us today. Huey, are you going to be around next week? I sure hope so. Bob. Yes, sir. Definitely. Ray, are you going to get your new internet going and everything's going to be fine? I'm going to do everything I can to make sure it works well. <laughs> All right. We, we, we hope, we wish you well. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, again, an hour has gone by quickly. You know what? We are going to be here at the same time, the same place, at the same group next week. So we will be here next week. Uh, everyone have a great week, and uh, we will see you again soon. Bye, now. Bye everyone. Thanks. Great job, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now.